I am in Tel Aviv, Israel with Daniel Abraham. Thanks for meeting me today. How are you doing, Daniel? Very well, and it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for taking the time to hear me out. Well, my column this month was on artificial intelligence, and you're with Arca, Orca Dental AI. That's the one. Um, so tell us your journey. How did, how did you end up in dentistry with AI? Um, well, the journey starts actually with my uh, father. It's, uh, I'm uh, second generation to this uh, dental business, but not as a practitioner. My father's an orthodontist, um, and I'm a technologist. And then about five years ago, we started realizing there's uh, interesting opportunities with regards to AI in general. AI started exploding, started becoming a very interesting uh, um, technological term. Um, with self-driving cars and all the way to medicine, and, and we just realized there's something that uh, is also going to shape uh, dentistry at some point, and why not uh, be the pioneers? Um, it just made total sense to us that the way medicine is progressing and the way uh, the, whole, the whole of uh, technology is progressing with the use of AI, there's a bunch of different opportunities in dentistry, and uh, we just went for it. So that's interesting. Your father was an orthodontist. Still so, is. So are you going to get genetic testing before you have children? <laughs> just so you stop this off. But that, but that explains why your first product was actually ortho-based. Because when you started, wasn't your first um, Cephex? Yeah, Cephex was, uh, and it's still running uh, today. Um, indeed, it's a uh, product uh, aimed for uh, orthodontists. It's a very basic service of cephalometric analyses for orthodontists. It's been, uh, cephalometric products have been out there since uh, since the early days of the computer. It's nothing new, but what is new, what we did add to it, was the AI angle. So basically what happens is that practitioners will send us their x-ray and we automatically do an analysis for them with no human intervention using AI and using deep learning and using algorithms and immediately uh, practitioners get a result. And that in itself was a revolutionary kind of moment uh, for us to realize that uh, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of opportunities here, not only in orthodontics, but all across dentistry. And yeah, it was the lowest hanging fruit. And you know, we knew uh, in-house uh, regarding the requirements of this analysis. So we just said, let's, let's give it a try with AI and see where it takes us. And the results are amazing. And when, when did this come out? Uh, it, the commercial product came out uh, after a lot of testing and a lot of uh, uh, improvements. It came out uh, almost three years ago. First of the first. Three years ago? Yeah. January 2017. January. And, and how's, how's that product been doing? Fantastic. I mean, it's just it, the, the ability to give immediate results um, is such a big game changer just because practitioners need the information now. They don't have time to wait or to, uh, you know, to uh, figure out which process internally or externally they need, to, um, they need to use in order to acquire their results. They just send it off and immediately they have a result. And that's, it makes all the difference. Um, and, and again, it, for us, it's like uh, um, it was sale. That wind in our sails, so to speak, to understand that there's there's just a huge opportunity here, um, in, in all forms of dentistry. So this uh, Cephex, yeah, that was your first product. Yep, been out three years. Um, is it taken off at different rates around the world? Oh, absolutely. First of all, um, the fact that we put something kind of new and and uh, um, I would say the the fact that there's in a field which has been around for a while, cephalometric analyses and, and computerized cephalometric analyses is nothing new. But uh, putting innovation into an existing field made us suddenly interesting, not only to practitioners, but also to partners and channels and distributors. And now we're integrated into uh, some of the providers of uh, dental imaging systems, uh, like Plan Mecca and so on, um, already have us kind of baked into their systems. Um, just because, again, everybody's looking for the unique edge. Everybody's looking for the, um, the ability to display innovation and provide better services through innovation. 
And that's what we're, we're all about. We're all about improving dentistry through innovation. And the type of innovation we bring to the table is AI. So your, your first adopt major partner adopter was Plan Mecca. Yeah. At a Helsinki, Finland. Yeah. And they own E4D out of Dallas, Texas with CAD CAM. Um, do they want any of your technology for their CAD CAM? Uh, uh, there's AI's so own? many things on the roadmap that, you know, obviously we're, we're shy to, to tell all our different projects, but uh, there's just a lot of different avenues. We, I mean, the more we get into the game, the more we see there's so much room in, in so many different verticals for AI that, uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a stack of projects where... where you know, it's on. funny. I, I live in Phoenix, Arizona, which is where Google tested their driverless cars. And um, they said for a lot of reasons, you know, year-round weather is good. Um, but um, it's so funny how so many people are uh, are worried about the uh, driverless car. It, it, it hit one person. Yeah. And yeah. it was just like, it was just like the whole city stopped and talked about it for a year. And, and I was like... Well, humans run over and kill a hundred people a day, yeah. and that didn't even touch them. Um, but um, when a AI killed one person, you know the whole uh, world had to stop. I, I don't know how AI has to be the future because I've witnessed natural intelligence, <laughs> and I'm not very impressed. <laughs> um, it seems like AI is um, more of a visual thing, an object-oriented thing. It, you know, I'm not um, a programmer. It, like not. Naturally, it is, but there's also a lot of AI sites that are not visual. For example, one of the biggest areas of, of AI um, is bots. Is and bots? Bots, yeah. Um, Google have their bot technology. Facebook have a, um, a big investment in bot technology. So the ability to interact with humans. Uh, then another side of AI is analytics. If we can take a large amount of information and extract crucial uh, data points or metrics that will help us understand what's going on either on a business uh, level or even on a clinical level, um, then you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, benefits to insurance companies and to DSOs. If we're, if we're going back to dental, there's a lot of different opportunities that are not necessarily only visual. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, again, we, we aim to provide services across the board not necessarily in one specific vertical. So would you, in dentistry, there's 10 specialties, um, endo, ortho. Right. So is ortho, the, the orthodontics and orthodontist, is that your biggest target market to date? Is your most success to date? Um, I, I would say it's the lowest hanging fruit, right? Just because, again, we had the in-house knowledge and clinical uh, experience and so on. But um, we've, moved on to, um, you know, larger scope of dentistry. And, and we, we don't even necessarily look at the speciality. We look at the image types, right? So we look at CBCT as a uh, up-and-coming uh, image, imaging um, procedure that is becoming ubiquitous, right? At, at some point, everything's going to be CBCT. There's no need for 2D if you have 3D machines and the radiation levels are going down. So all the advantages are going to be in, in 3D. Um, so that's an imaging type that we look at and say, okay, where can, can we bring value here? And we've already built out uh, quite an interesting um, automated uh, segmenting tool. I'll show it to you later. Or if you want, you can uh, display it as part of the... Uh, what, what is it, on your laptop? Oh, you can actually access it on your mobile. So, But that's what I'm filming you with. Oh, I'll um, show you yeah, on my mobile open, right open, now. Open up yours. Okay. Didn't realize it'll be... Um, Okay, so what we do is we take a, um, a CBCT that is sent to us. Anybody can upload a CBCT to our system. We automatically uh, segment all the objects so we know how to look at the bone and say, this is the maxilla, this is the mandible, we, every tooth is an object, and convert that automatically into an STL. And then once it's an STL, uh, basically a bunch of STL objects, it's very easy to build out viewers and, and uh, different um, Systems that can manipulate that. So, I don't know, I've got it on my phone. I, yeah, yeah, just show it right to the camera. Okay. So, here's a good example of here, a. Let's do it closer. Okay. Okay. Our phones are. Yeah, so everything's on the phone, right? Today, um, being able to generate accessibility um, and um, 
being able to take the information that's embedded into these CBCT images. And this is a, um, this is a basic 3D viewer of a CBCT. But uh, the difference here is the, these are all STL files. So I can, I can re remove the STL the, files. You're talking to dentist. Um, a dentist is like a 3D printable file. And that's called an STL file? STL file is a standard for 3D printable files. So today where you have labs and interaction between uh, 3D scanners and um, when you have interaction between labs that uh, will build out the um, reconstruction of the tooth or implants or, or 3D scanners, all the files that are created are STL based. So if you do a 3D scan on a patient... It went dark. So, oh. There you are. And we're reading all the messages from yeah, friends. I, I hope uh, nothing too intimate. <laughs> okay. Um, so well, let me see if I can go from here. So here's a good example. Like this was a CBCT file sent. We automatically um, located the nerve and drew it out. And actually the nerve is a 3D, is a STL file, 3D printable file. Each tooth here is printable. Um, for us to create an implant is really simple. Um, you just drag the implant where you want it to be and it's all done automatically on your phone, very accessible, very good for patient uh, communication and case acceptance, very good to get a feel of, okay, I'm going into surgery. I want to quickly understand what's going to, you know, what I'm going to do in that, uh, uh, procedure. And, uh, the point is with AI, you can automate a lot of these processes and make it really accessible because the problem with data today is that there's a huge amount of data. People are taking CBCTs, but it's not accessible. It's available, but not accessible. And what AI does is take that data and make it accessible. Surface it, surface it to the uh, user. So if it's uh, in the form of uh, pathology issues that are in the, uh, you know, are embedded somewhere in the patient's oral uh, health, uh, cysts, findings, where the nerve is, or anomalies, anything of that nature can be easily surfaced to the practitioner with AI. Um, and if it's, on the other hand, saving the practitioner clicks and make streamlining digital processes, which are more and more time consuming, it's another side of AI where we can uh, benefit from automating a lot of procedures. So so on, let's go back to your Ceph product. Um, so does the um, orthodontist, he takes a stuff and then he has to upload it to your website? And what, how does that work? Does he upload it to, your your website is orca hyphen um, so the, AI? The, um, the SaaS um, offering we have, the uh, software as a service, really, it's just an, a web platform, is actually at cephx.com. Okay, cephx.com. Right, so that's cephx.com. Um, you go in, you register, and yeah, you can start sending off SEFs, and you can start sending off uh, um, DICOM, 3D DICOM images. So you just upload your images. It automatically generates um, this 3D viewer that you can go into and start uh, seeing the patient's pathology from different views. And again, remember, there's no human interaction. There's nothing that's happened that's gone through a person to get those results. You wait a couple of minutes, you get your results, and now you can start uh, basically getting more insight um, where previously, in order to do that, you needed a DICOM viewer and looking into slices and it's more complex and more time consuming and you need to be in front of your computer and, and you have to have gone through the learning curve of the software, um, the software packages where with CephX, all you do is you've got a 3D intuitive viewer. Anybody can just spin around a, a 3D object and suddenly... You're looking at different views of impacted, uh, impacted teeth and nerve replacement, and you, we have an airway report, and a lot of different pieces of information that uh, surface to you without any effort. You didn't have to even learn software in order to be able to use it. You should write an article on that for Orthotown. Uh, that goes to the 10,800 orthodontists in the United States. Okay. But that, that, I'm sure they would love to read an article on that. Yeah, we have more and more orthodontists using us just because CBCT is becoming so uh, prevalent in orthodontics suddenly that, I mean, for a lot of cases, especially impacted canines, this is a specific uh, use case, it's very difficult to, um, to see just through a pan 
and a Ceph. And a lot of the time, orthodontists, what they'll do is they'll, they'll just extract a pan and a Ceph. So they're taking a 2D snapshot of a 3D image just because the 3D software is so complex. And instead of doing that, why not just upload it, get a quick snapshot and a proper 3D view of what's going on, and you've got a lot of more information that you otherwise it's difficult to see, even in a pan or Ceph. So were you able to talk your father into using this? Yeah, he's crazed about it, he's using <laughs> it all the time. But he might be a little subjective, so I don't know. <laughs> so... Um... If someone, um, it looks like the future of this, uh, the next will go to oral radiology, the, the people reading the CBCTs. Um, I have a CBCT, and in my office, sometimes three of us dentists, all old, looking at the CBCT, looking at each other like, we, we, we don't even know what that is sometimes. That's I mean, it kind of looks like a Hubble space telescope. Um, do you see oral radio, this uh, AI going next to oral radiology actually reading the CBCT for you? Well, ORCA is basically an acronym for oral care, right? That's how we came up with ORCA. Okay. Um, so, yes, we are any imaging that has to do with the oral condition of a, a customer or a patient, we are interested in giving, um, again, reports, information, data, analytics. Um, and basically anything that can help to create a better treatment plan, a more informed treatment plan, um, and ultimately better treatment. Um, so, yes, to your question, we definitely want to provide services to um, uh, professionals reading and deciphering oral uh, imagery, including oral radiology. I think it's funny. Um, when you live long enough, you get to see the same rodeo again. When I got school in 87, Panos you know, that was coming yeah. out. And, and the biggest thing in oral radiology was when this company came out and they figured, they put an R on one side and an L on the other. And that was absolutely <laughs> the biggest oral radiology innovation. I, I still think it trumps anything we've ever done because when you showed it to the patient, the first thing they'd say is, oh, that's my right side? That's my, the, the R and the L was the only thing that everybody um, watched. But it's funny when, when the Pano came out, you know what the uh, naysayers said about it? They so said, there's always well, a bunch of them. Well, it's going to show you areas and there might be disease and you didn't see it and you didn't diagnose it and it's going to come back and bite you because you missed pathology. And then 30 years later, the CBC rolls out. What is the same argument? Oh, all this diet. Yeah. It's like, dude, that's exactly what they said three decades ago. Um, and it didn't make a difference. So it's funny how um, it always comes back the same. So I noticed AI... Um, the, the, I noticed that insurance companies um, are using it, and they've already um, found dentists resubmitting the same x-ray oh, yeah. for like 80 root canals in a row. That was in California. Someone's going to go to jail for that. I noticed that some Crown and Bridge laboratories are now reading the impression to see if this was a good impression. Um, and now you're doing um, the ortho. Um, where, where else do you think um, AI is going to end up? in the future. So again, like one of the basic examples is uh, implant planning. Or you, you're talking out of the scope of dentistry? No, just no, just in, in, more, in more dentistry. Okay, so again... So the, implant planning? Implant planning is, is our basic next kind of product that we're rolling out right now. Is, is it, is, are you rolling it out now or it's, it's no, still no, in beta? It's, it's right now. So okay, so where, where could they go to see this right now? Um, so, again, you just go to CephX, upload a CBCT, and you will get uh, the ability to see our viewers. Spell out CephX. C-E-P-H-X. So, if the, he goes to C-E-P-H dot X. No, 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 not dot X. C-E-P-H-X dot com. Sorry. C-P-H-X. You missed the H. C-P-H-X right, dot, dot com. com. Right. Right now, you can load up your... Um, CBCT. Yep. And then treatment plan it with an implant. And then you can start treatment plan with the implant. You can start playing around seeing all kinds of impactions and, and uh, pathologies that are otherwise difficult to sometimes... Is it agnostic to the implant system or do you enter this... Entirely agnostic to the CBCT system. Even any, you know, partial CBCTs, full view CBCTs, quadrant uh, scans, anything it knows how to accept and will analyze that specific image uh, accordingly. And it's also, regarding the implant system, again, it's more to give you a feel of 
how to quickly uh, decipher which implant I want to use or, you know, what space or how much bone do I have or what's my distance to the nerve and so on. So it's, it's more of a, it doesn't even look at an implant system, it looks just like at a measurement. I've got a, you know, a, a 10 millimeter or I don't know, 15 millimeter implant on a three, uh, 3.2 uh, diameter implant. How would that look uh, in the current pathology without having to go through the uh, proper, you know, deep implant planning systems, which are maybe uh, super accurate, but they're very time consuming, long learning curve and hard to show the patient because it's not, you know, available on your mobile with three clicks. And that's what we're trying to do. We believe that making the information available is the next leap at providing better uh, care and better treatment plan. So to reduce the number of appointment, appointments, I mean, kind of more like same day, like I imagine if you went to the orthodontist and he, did, he took a pano and a sept and said, I'm, I'm not going to tell you the answer until next week, that wouldn't be nearly as exciting as taking a pano and a sept and getting a diagnosis. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Again, I... The, uh, the way we see the advantage of AI, it, it's, it, it's a game changer in two different vectors. And we want to provide services in both those vectors. One vector is the pathologies, right? How can I surface issues that otherwise would be difficult for you as a practitioner to notice, right? Because you're not a radiologist and you don't always want to send all your cases to, you know, an external service. But you do want to know if there is something there that you haven't noticed. You're even there are questionables of how liable you are now that you have all the information. So that's one part. How do we surface crucial information? Cysts, uh, cancerous or, uh, or growths of some sort, um, all kinds of pathologies, defects and so on. We want to surface that to you. Otherwise, it might be very difficult for you to find. Um, so that's a one, one vector. The other vector is how do we streamline and make your digital process faster and easier and more available? And that translates into faster treatment. So we, we don't necessarily know how it's going to change the flow of dentistry, but we do know that we're going to be saving time and increasing accuracy and increasing findings of crucial information. <clears throat> and if we can provide those, you know, those uh, benefits to the practitioner, as far as we're concerned, you know, we've... we've so, uh, so you John. said earlier that AI is kind of three areas, visual, bots, and analytics? The, uh, yeah, the, the, the areas that are relevant to dentistry, yeah. So let's go to bots. Do you have plans with bots? No, currently currently bots is not an area we're going to deal with, but we do want to... But explain bots again. Well, yeah. bots is more... Uh, it, uh, it's referring to a question you had generally about right. AI. Where does AI bring benefit uh, other than the visual uh, scope. So yeah. there are other areas. Bots was just an example. But, when, what, but what is a bot, though? A bot is a system which helps um, a platform, so to speak. To, it helps <coughs> um, you create an interaction with the customer uh, with no human intervention. So, so if you're a, a website. Right. Okay. So if I'm a company and I want to be able to help a potential customer, but I don't have enough funds now to build out a sales or support team, I could theoretically build a bot that knows to some extent to help out or to answer questions that uh, may arise from customers um, to a certain extent. But that seems that seems very important to us because almost every dentist has a website. At some point, absolutely. And, and when you um, talk to the marketing people, um, they'll do a, say they do a big campaign of direct mail, they drive a whole bunch of people to your website. Right. There's only a 3% conversion from I go to your website to I call your office. And so I've noticed a lot of people, you know, if only 3% of the people land on your site convert, you get a lot of room for growth. Oh, absolutely. And um, I'm sure so, a lot of them have questions. So and you're starting to see um, people starting to do services with um, the little, ch I, I call it a chat window. Chatbot. Uh, chat Facebook have a great platform for it uh, to be able to take the information or the questions. Or, did you or know the, Facebook, the, the owner of that, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, did you know his dad's a dentist? No, I didn't realize that. Yeah, Ed Zuckerberg is a dentist. Huh. And um, so I always tease Ed because Ed and I both have four kids and his kids started Facebook. And uh, <laughs> I always tease. Uh, um, but anyway, um, in, interesting deal. But yeah, I, I, think the, I think the website bots... On the dentist website, if you could, if you could take the conversion from three percent to just four, absolutely, that's a huge. I would imagine that if there's a lot of 
potential customers and they have unanswered questions and you could build out a system which answers at least some of these questions and then takes them further down the journey of, okay, here's a problem, here's a possible solution. Why don't you come in and, and visit the uh, practitioner? Makes a lot of sense that that would... And then you, know. you said the other area was analytics. Right. And the, um, the biggest... Um, rub on physicians, dentists, and lawyers is they're they're really good at their art, but they don't know their numbers. They don't. And um, the weird thing in dentistry is that the software that runs your dental office isn't connected to your accounting software, Quicken. So, do you see um, AI moving there in the future of uh, analytics of your business? Absolutely. And I would say to begin with, it would you know the kind of lowest hanging fruit in that respect would be the DSOs and insurance companies. Because right, these are big organizations who are trying to control or gauge the quality of their practitioners and their providers. And from what we've seen, there's a big issue with that. It's very difficult because dentistry by nature is so fragmented and, and so unstandardized in a lot of ways. It's, it's hard to kind of be able to give a benchmark where the practitioners are um, good for you as a DSO or damaging for you as a DSO. And there's a big challenge that they're having to deal with in order to, um, you know, answer that question. And AI is a perfect kind of system to be able to decipher large pieces of information that you could feed in regarding a practitioner. And then the system or the computer would say, well, here are some, you know, here are our, this is the computer's findings regarding practitioners and so on. And uh, that also extends into the actual patients. If you could gauge the likelihood of, of patients, um, uh, you know, going through successful treatment or um, being a good uh, clinical prospect for, for successful treatment, um, AI would definitely be able to help in that respect. But that's definitely further down the line for us. So, so tell us what was the, the first out of the box was the ortho at um, sethx.com. Yeah. That and how many how many products do you have out now? How many? Oh, we have about uh, I would say ten different services that that you get right now on Cephex.com. Yep. you just send a, a case and you get. Uh, tell, tell them the ten. Go go through them. Okay, so you have cephalometric analyses, you have uh, um, the airway analysis, you have uh, the segmentation tool, um, which is pretty much what I showed you earlier. Uh, you have the video tool. Uh, you have a panoramic uh, creator. So it automatically takes a CBCT, creates a, the panoramic with the uh, nerve marking. You have the Ceph uh, from CBCT. Uh, you have the um, STL uh, generation. So basically you can download a zip file with all the STL files that are generated and import them into different systems if you want to. Um, losing my count. Um, we, did I mention the implant planner? Uh, I'm not sure if that's out yet uh, uh, in production. We might still how, be how, only um, With the world's internet capacity, how um, hard is it to upload a CBCT? Does it vary? A between countries or city? Yeah, it really or... depends on your internet connection. I mean, we're working tirelessly to make the process as easy and smooth as, as possible. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's just you drag and drop a file and it's like, you know, putting a file into Dropbox. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So w which countries is this, um, are you taking off in uh, the most? So uh, our largest customer base, uh, base uh, is in the US, Canada, uh, UK, Australia basically English-speaking countries. Um, but we've got customers from literally every imaginable. I mean, I don't think there's a country where we don't have a customer. Um, Most of the dental companies that I've talked to break up the whole world market into thirds. Uh, U.S., Canada, third, Europe, third, the rest of the world, a third. Right. Um, but you were saying U.S., Canada, that should be a third. But then you were saying instead of Europe, you said Australia, U.K., so why, why yeah, do you we, think we more just, Australia, UK, as opposed to just like Europe? Um, well, firstly, for some reason, it picked up well in those countries. So even, you know, we, we put very little effort in marketing. Most of our uh, effort goes to R&D. Um, and, and we want to provide our services initially 
on the SaaS platform, like everything online, everything internet based, everything um, available, not not through channels, but rather through just online access. So for some reason, it picked up well in those countries, I would imagine just because of the English speaking nature. Uh, but yeah, if you look at it on a, on a business level, um, probably a good way to look at it is US, Canada, Europe, and then ROW. So how long have you, so are you a programmer? Are you an AI developer? I'm, I'm uh, my background is uh, with technology. I've uh, formed several technology companies, not only in the dental space, but in, uh, in different advertising, online advertising spaces. So I'm very well, um, my kind of natural uh, core competence is, is online. Um, and then I, together with my father's clinical knowledge, we put together, you know, this idea of how do we, Take the technology, how do we take the clinical, put it together and, and give a valuable service to practitioners. So all the dentists are online advertising. They're all trying to promote their yeah. practice. What, what did you learn from online advertising and AI? Wow. Uh, I've never mixed between, never got to deal with both of them at the same time. Uh, I know there are companies that deal with that aspect, but they're more on how to improve the platforms rather than assist the uh, the users, right? The users want to get the most bang for their buck, basically. And the platforms want to provide that to be the best and most attractive platform. So to help the platforms provide that, they now use AI to decipher where and what situations, um, and which would be the best potential customer and so on um, to provide best conversions for, for practitioners. So, um, Elon Musk has told everybody that, um, this is a really bad idea. <laughs> How many more years before the robots take us over, kill us and say, some people say that the only purpose of a biological human being was to connect us to AI. And as soon as your iPhone has a opposing thumbs that can walk, <laughs> and if you think about it, it's, it's kind of true because, um, Right now, um, outside of uh, 30 miles up in the air, it's all droids. There's no, right now we have droids on Mars and we have right. Voyager right. left the solar system. Do, do you think that's kind of a, do you think Elon Musk is right that? I think there's definitely, you know, we're at the brink of a revolution with regards to how um, computerized systems can help humanity. Uh, I have no doubt about that. And I think it's going to be prevalent on all, you know, all sides of and all different aspects of life. Um, I think they're also like, you know, there tends to be an exaggeration. People like to say interesting and kind of flamboyant statements that, uh, uh, you know, get, pe get people's attention. But uh, there's also, you know, a lot of barriers here and a lot of, uh, I, I think we're, we're still far away from uh, <laughs> Skynet taking over and the Terminator coming and... Uh, so what is your taking biggest challenge um, in taking your company to the U.S.? What, what? Um, the biggest challenge, um, I would say it's less about the fact that it's U.S. It's more about uh, just the fact that we um, are very focused on technology. Like we like the edge. We like to be light years ahead of uh, anybody else. And... and uh, it takes a, some time to educate a market. Right? Even natural and, and immediate uh, products, um, it takes time to explain the value and, and get the practitioners to have an aha moment. Um, so that's the biggest challenge. How do we get the practitioners to understand how beneficial this really is to their process? Um, and, you know, that's, you know, we're working on it and we're, I'm sure we're going to get there because... What we're aiming for is that the advantage be so great that it would take very little effort to explain why it helps, right? If, they, if you could have automated everything, you wouldn't really have to explain why it's good for you, but not everything is automated. So you have to explain why these increments of automation already help you as a practitioner. Well, your marketing should just be, uh, think of your last thought, that's natural intelligence. <laughs> You know, you, you can only get better than that. But I think what's most exciting about your area is that, you know, cleanings, fillings, exams, x-rays, that's a very mature, century-old market. I mean, it goes back to Pierre Fichard, you know, 200 years ago. And it, it grows one and a half, two and a half, three percent 
But the only double-digit growth in dentistry around the world is implants and ortho, clear liners and yep. implants. And you're in both of those right. areas in spades. Right. So to have a company with two feet and one's in implants and one's in clear liners, um, have are you doing anything with the um, the Invisalines of the world? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of... Um, Firstly, there's a lot of automation uh, we're working on in those areas, um, and there's a lot of kind of built-in problems with uh, uh, meshing, uh, intraoral scans and CBCT images. Intraoral scan only gives you so much information and, and impacts on the predictability um, of, the, of the treatment. So we're helping build systems that um, give you more information and help you better tr uh, create a treatment plan. For your, uh, so Align patients. Technology, which owns Invisalign and Itero, um, right. I noticed they wanted their own oral scanner system right. and weren't excited about being open to other systems or lawsuits with three shape and et cetera. But is that, was that part of that challenge? Was Align Technology trying to have their own scanner to control it to um, make it well, work better? We, we kind of stay out of that game. It's not really, you know, we want to be agnostic to everything. So it doesn't matter which system you're using, which scanner you're using. We want to provide services to you as a practitioner and not you as a specific platform user. So you like um, to say I'm agnostic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but do you, um, but is it still a challenge of taking an oral scan and a CBCT and putting that into one? Oh, absolutely. One absolutely. It it's it's a challenge because... But that's where I was going out thinking maybe a line was trying to help solve that problem. But um, Again, it's, it's a technological challenge taking two different image sets that really have nothing to do with each other um, and tying them together in a very easy and immediate manner. The minute you have the user, ha you know, you require the user to click here and click there and learn where to click and which bells and whistles you're supposed to use, you've already reduced the amount of users that are going to interact with that drastically. And the minute you make it automatic and, you know, entirely uh, w with no human interaction and just here it is, just send us the images and it's, it's available immediately, then we believe that's the, the next leap of, okay, by standard... You take an image, you take a CBCT, you take an intraoral scan, you've got the whole picture. Is, um, do you think CBCT is moving in orthodontics, is it moving towards a standard of care? I mean, you talked earlier about someone having a pano and maybe bite wings. Um, do you think in orthodontics, especially for this big clear aligner market, which is exploding because everybody wants right. wider, brighter, straighter, sexier smiles, do you, do you think CBCTs is uh, going to be the standard of care, and that everyone to go three D and two D will fade away? I'm I'm certain of it. Um, regardless of AI, I'm certain of it just because I see um, the um, I, I see the evolution happening um, with regards to just the basic kind of pieces of information that CBCT provides. There's a lot of cases where you simply cannot see. Uh, what's going on with Pano, and then you kind of have to guess. Um, and you need CBCT in order to, to get those pieces of information. And then the next layer is AI, and I think AI will actually help uh, CBCT become ubiquitous in, in orthodontics. Nice. Um, so, um, my gosh, I'd like to say, I, I really... It, Orthodontist is your lowest hanging fruit, right? Yeah. Orthodontist. You, you should write a, or, an article for Orthotown and, um, or, or, or even uh, um, publish it on a Dental Town's platform. But um, this month, my column was on AI. And basically, to summarize the column, I said AI is on third. And what it was was um, analogy to baseball that when I um, – my first base hit, I was yeah. so innovative that I copied um, my next door neighbor and became a dentist. Uh, <laughs> you know, I went to work with my dad, who worked at a, a restaurant and made hamburgers and hot dogs. And then my next door neighbor, Kenny Anderson, was a dentist. So the, my best idea was Kenny had a better job than my dad. So my, my first uh, base hit was to first base dentist. And then that was in 87, and at the end of the first decade, I saw this internet thing take off, and so many people uh, did not believe in it back then, and I, and I did it for selfish reasons that um, I wanted to talk to other dentists. 
And so we started Dental Town in '98, and I've been uh, that was second base for me, and that was 20 years ago. But I told every um, everybody, wow, yeah, early, yeah, that was early. I, I was five years before Facebook. They, I, I came out in '90. Uh, started, I got the idea in '98 to hire my first programmer, and got a launch in '99. And Zuckerberg came out in 2004. And then I said, as second base, I said, you know, you know, who's on third? AI. And now it's what I think is interesting is like um, two or three years ago, I never heard anybody talking about AI on right. downtown. Right. And now it's, it's the, the new big thing. And you're like, say, insurance companies are talking about it. And I look at the insurance companies. And I just think to me, um, they have the biggest data set. Yeah. When when you hear Dennis arguing for hours on hours and, and usually involving alcohol, uh, what lasts longer, an amalgam or a composite, and they and they don't even know the answer. And I'm sitting there thinking, insurance companies are sitting on hundreds of millions of claims and could tell you exactly what lasts longer. And then the other thing that um, annoys me is um, new products come out. Right. But Dennis just entered the chart. I did a composite. Well, obviously you did a composite, you know, you, know, you don't buy any amount, but there's a lot of brands of composite. Could you imagine, I can see a future where um, a new product comes out and within a year, AI says, you know what? This has already been tried a hundred thousand times and it already failed 10% in the first year. And then everybody's like, wow. Hmm. So that, need, that needs to go back to the drawing board. And I, I, um, I was really excited when I saw that these dental insurance companies were using AI on a radiograph, which to me is laughable that when I do a root canal, when I build the insurance, the only thing they want is an x-ray, just proof that I'm not a lying sociopath. Right. And I really did the x-ray. And of course they caught one that was actually a lying sociopath. But I always thought, um, what I want to know when I send in my x-ray is, uh, how does it look compared to everyone else's or what is my success rate? So I've been billing insurance claims to Delta of dental of Arizona, my own state for 32 years. And they never once sent me back a report that said, how are your fillings last half as long as the average or, yeah. or, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or so I, I hope the future is that the notes are, Okay, you did a filling, but was it what was the brand name of the filling? What was right. the bonding agent? And it goes uh, back to the analytics uh, aspect yeah. of how do we take and, and they're challenged by. I mean, it's not like they're not trying. They they want it for themselves, but it's just too much information to be able to extract like crucial bits of of data that help you you know come to your conclusion. So. Um, so definitely there's going to be an improvement and AI is going to contribute in that area. Last, last final question. We all have, uh, we all have kids. I have four kids, five grandkids. Um, if AI is going to be the next internet, you know, it's going to change the world in a big way. So does that usually mean look, go, go to school and learn how to program in Python? Is that the, what was that movie where he said, uh, what was that movie where he kept giving everybody the secret? And it was like cement or, what, what was that movie where fiber, cement? Anyway, uh, is, is Python the future language? Well, I would say uh, it's not a specific language. It's a, a discipline. And uh, the, um, the academic world is definitely gravitating towards providing more and more courses in that discipline of AI. Um, it, it doesn't really matter if it's specific. Python is just like an easy... Uh, very available language, but there's many others. And uh, is Python like the HTTP was for the when the internet came out? Everybody was going to learn HTTP. To no, 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 no. It's it's not in that way. It just has a lot of very available libraries that you can use to do shortcuts um, to get to the results that you want to do. Um, but it's not uh, HTTP was more like uh, how do we make it available for anybody who doesn't even know programming. You still have to know how to program. You still have to be kind of dedicated to the discipline. And academics are pushing towards that more and more just because there's a growing need. And now it's challenging to find uh, uh, programmers and developers in these types of languages. Ten years' time, it's just going to be, you know, everybody's going to know. That's going to be the basics. And let me let me give you the uh, historical analysis on that. I, I started uh, Creighton University of College in 1980. And my um, career counselor guy, 
he's, I wouldn't have told him I want to be a dentist. He told me I had to sign up for either Fortran or Cobalt. I said, why do I want to take Fortran or Cobalt? He goes, he says, son, when you're my age, if you can't program Fortran or Cobalt, you'll be illiterate. And I, and it scared me, but I wanted to take all my pre-dental recs. So I, 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 I decided I was going to be a dentist and go uh, uh, illiterate. Um, last but not least, I, I hope you uh, comment on, after my call in this month, uh, AIs on third, and um, um, and tell them what you're doing. And um, it was just uh, an honor to uh, podcast you. Thank you so much for meeting me today. Thank you very much. <laughs>